a president for all Singaporeans. Every community of Singaporeans will be my parish. His first job was as an office boy, and his last, President of Singapore. Coming from a humble background, S.R. Nathan was living proof that any Singaporean can aspire to the highest office in the land if he is prepared to work hard and serve. He's got the courage, he's got the commitment, he's absolutely, totally reliable. If you're going to war, you want somebody like him to be your buddy. From the adversities of childhood and youth, I learned never to shun the rough and tumble of life. I learned to look at life in the face. Adversity struck when Nathan was just eight. The rubber slump of the 1930s sent his family's fortunes crashing. Unable to cope with the hardship, young Nathan's father committed suicide, leaving behind his wife and seven children. Nathan was thrown out of school twice. At 16, he left home and worked briefly as an office boy before leaving for Johor, vowing to return only after he had made a success of his life. In Muar, he worked as a hawker assistant and taught English to a group of Tamil road sweepers. But life was about to throw him another curveball. In 1942, Japan invaded Singapore. To survive, Nathan taught himself Japanese with the help of a dictionary given by a Japanese lieutenant. He became a translator. The war years were a life-changing experience. I belong to the Straits Bond generation, who before the war believed in our sort of British uh, subject status. And the war really shattered all that. Little did he know, more profound experiences were in store. In July 1943, Indian nationalist leader Subhash Chandra Bose, who was fighting for India's independence from the British, addressed a crowd in Singapore. Young Nathan was among them. And this man came with his motorcade and went on the hall, city hall steps and he began to make his speech. As he made his speech for, in English, it began to drizzle and the crowd began to be uneasy and be dispersed. And that's the time I heard a tongue lashing which I shall never forget. His words were to the effect that, look, I've come here to ask for your blood and you run before this little drizzle. What kind of people are you? Have you no backbone to stand up for yourself? He gave them such a tongue lashing, everybody sat down. Of course, for a person of my age, listening to such a thing and also to get all these big people getting a tongue lashing, I suppose, was exciting. But it aroused in me a, a political consciousness, which I hadn't been there. After the war, Nathan, who had joined the Public Works Department, took time off on a Shell scholarship to obtain his diploma in social work at the University of Malaya. He graduated with distinction. His thesis on the welfare of Asian seamen was his first exposure to labour issues. The defining part of my life has been the labour movement and uh, social work. So as every challenge came, you learnt on the job. The early 1960s saw years of labour unrest in Singapore. Workers rioted in the streets. Strikes were regular affairs. In 1961 alone, more than 410,000 man days were lost to strikes. But behind the labour unrest were pro-communist leaders who had infiltrated the unions. By now, Nathan was a seaman's welfare officer and well regarded for his sympathies for the workers. In December 1961, Finance Minister Go King Sui convinced Nathan to accept his appointment at the newly established Labour Research Unit. Serving and winning over the workers was a life and death struggle. I said, sir, I'm a civil servant. You want me to go into trade union work? Then he told me, he says, no, this is a fight to the end. If those fellows win, they will put you and me and have us shot. 
So that's the choice you have. I mean, you can keep away, but if it happens, this is what will happen. So try and do your best. I say, okay, sir, I try and do my best. This would be the first of many times in his life when Nathan found himself in uncharted territory. When you get to a place, uh, no, you have no book of instructions. You have to use your own, own, own sense of what, what to do or what not to do. The tension faced was manifold. The workers wanted militant unions to fight for them. The Economic Development Board wanted industrial peace to attract foreign investments. The Labour Research Unit needed credibility to be effective. In this hostile environment, Nathan faced threats of physical assaults and acid attacks. Yet he made significant gains, much of them away from the public eye. His unit helped put in place reasonable terms of employment in the National Iron and Steel Mill. It helped Jurong Shipyard formulate an acceptable wage structure. It convinced the government to provide the funds to train a core of better educated activists. His achievements did not go unnoticed. Every time there was a tricky task which required a steady hand, someone dependable and who could get things done, his name would crop up. Many people believe that as a government we select people by their academic credentials. Yes, we do, but only in part. We place much greater weight on character. In 1965, Nathan was posted to the Foreign Ministry. At the opening of the Ministry's Diplomatic Academy in 2008, the President spoke on those early years. As a small country, we took a realistic view of its limitations and constraints. We knew very well that we had very little influence over our external environment. Others expected us as a small state to recognize our vulnerability and adopt a passive approach in our foreign relations so as to avoid retaliation. We chose to make a stand when our interests were at stake. But making such a stand in the mid-60s was a big challenge for the young country. In 1967, Nathan learned a bitter lesson in Bangkok when talks on the ASEAN Declaration hit an impasse. ASEAN was against having foreign bases in the region. Singapore, led by Foreign Minister S. Rajaratnam, felt otherwise. And Mr. Rajaratnam told his Indonesian counterpart, Adam Malik, so. How can I, fighting a communist insurgency, agree with you to put in this, in this provision that we want to dismantle the British bases? No, no, no. Adam Malik, no, no, I will not. Then Mr. Rajaratnam told me, you know, right? Try and redraft that, that provision. Nathan knew there was a provision in the Portsdam Declaration that foreign bases may remain so long as they enjoy the wishes of the people. Together with the Malaysian and Thai aides, he redrafted the provision that was finally reflected in the preamble to the ASEAN Declaration. Two years earlier, Nathan himself stood firm in a tense situation. This was after the bombing of McDonald House in Orchard Road during the period of confrontation with Indonesia. Two Indonesian Marines were caught, prosecuted, convicted, and sentenced to hang. Following the execution, Nathan received a call from the Indonesian embassy requesting the bodies be turned over to lie in state at the embassy. Dr. Goh, who was the minister in charge, was already in bed and I was there with a few of us. So he asked me, what do you want? He said, oh, I want this. I said, sorry. As far as you are concerned, the two persons are being punished under our laws. Once you, you take the bodies out of our shores, out of our jurisdiction, into your territory, you can treat them whatever you like. You want them to treat him like a hero, whatever you can do it, because he was very angry. I said, no. He said, I want to see Dr. Go. I said, no, you can't see him. He's, he's sleeping. 
there were to be more foreign threats to deal with in Northern's future. In 1971, Northern was appointed Director of Security and Intelligence at the Defence Ministry. During his tenure, he had to deal with a number of terrorist acts. 31st January 1974 Terrorists from the Japanese Red Army and the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine had attacked oil storage tank facilities on Pulau Buko. They took as hostages five crew members of the Lanju, a ferry. Northern and 12 other civil servants offered to accompany the hijackers to Kuwait as a guarantee of safe passage in exchange for the freedom of the hostages. But in Kuwait, the authorities would not allow the plane carrying the hijackers to land. The skilled negotiator in Northern broke the impasse. The hijackers disembarked and Northern and his colleagues returned to a hero's welcome. The hostage drama had lasted seven and a half days and made world headlines. He is fully aware of the danger and uncertainty that we will, we will have to face when we arrive in Kuwait. Despite that, Mr. Northern kept a very steady head, very cool, very calm, and uh, he engaged the terrorist who was inside our plane throughout the journey. I think that shows the courage of the man knowing what he has to face and yet he was able to rise effectively to the occasion. A National Day Award, the Meritorious Service Medal, followed the same year. The general term is that politics can be, can be, can be dirty, but uh, if, as you suggest, because it's dirty, it's not possible to be clean and honest. Then it's not possible to be clean and honest anywhere. So Northern's I response to a question on his work as security and intelligence chief was most telling on how he saw his duty to his country, whatever the task might be. Well, I know, you know, in the work of SID, uh, there's mystery, uh, there's this odium. People consider it obnoxious uh, that you are indulging in, in intelligence work. But this intelligence work is not in, on behalf of yourself or on behalf of a company. It's on behalf of the nation. So it is a trust in place on you to find for your nation the kind of information that the nation needs to conduct its policies. And yet you have got to do things sometimes at great risk to your, your person. Your person. It has to be done. And no nation in the world is exempt from it. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. There are no angels. In 1982, Northern was appointed executive chairman of the Straits Times Press. I had enjoined him to handle the Straits Times like a piece of fine porcelain, which if broken up would be a loss to the country. Six years on, it was back to diplomacy work for Northern. In 1988, he was appointed High Commissioner to Malaysia and in 1990, Ambassador to the United States. The posting was marked by a delicate period in bilateral relations. In March 1994, an American teenager living in Singapore, Michael Fay, pleaded guilty to two charges of vandalism and was caned after he lost his appeal against his sentence. In Washington, D.C., Ambassador Northern faced an outraged American media. A new generation of Singaporeans got to see the cool head that had faced down the Lanju terrorists 20 years earlier. Do you personally agree with the concept of punishment? This kind of punishment? Well, uh, it's appropriate as far as it's legally sanctioned. I certainly agree. Do you think 
uh, your president and others in Singapore, the judge, the appeals, might consider that uh, here is a boy, he, the boy has, we understand, some physical and emotional problems. He's got a father whose mother was in Auschwitz. He's, uh, he's an American. It was an act of vandalism. Whether he did it or didn't do it, there was drinking. I mean, some extenuating circumstances here, two friendly nations might say, let's pass on this one. Well, Larry, uh, I don't want to be provocative, but I think, you know, victimhood is not an excuse as far as we are concerned, you know. Uh, we have to have a, a crime, at least a relatively crime-free society where people are safe and free to walk about and our laws are enforced strictly, they're transparent, and uh, that's what applies to all cases. As to whether... He was very firm, very not excited, very calm in the way he defended the opposition without apologizing at all. Uh, for the view that we take of the incident and the measures that we take to make sure that such things do not become common in Singapore. We are a new country. We have to establish certain norms. We have to uphold certain laws. We cannot make exceptions because one is a big power and another is a small one. And uh, they have to get a measure of this. In 1996, Northern returned from Washington, D.C. Then Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister Dr. Tony Tan had asked him to be director of a new Singapore think tank, the Institute for Defence and Strategic Studies. It was another new challenge. But the tried and tested Northern would soon be called to the most important job of his life. He was in his mid-70s, but his service to the nation was far from over. And then the band in attendance, comprising members of the police band and the Singapore Infantry Regiment Band, played the national... Since independence in 1965, Singapore's head of state, the president, was elected by parliament and he acted on the advice of the government. But in 1991, the constitution was amended. The president would now be elected directly by the people. He would exercise, at his discretion, custodial or veto power over the spending of the reserves and in the appointment of key public officials. When Singapore's first elected president, Ong Teng Cheong, announced he would not be running for another term, a few names were suggested as viable candidates. 75-year-old S. R. Nathan was among them. He shared his surprise at this with then-senior minister Lee Kuan Yew. Why me? And why, as I, as I told uh, the senior minister, I said, I'm yesterday's man. Why do you ask me to do it? But I have a sense of obligation, an obligation to him, to all his colleagues, for the trust they placed in me. On nomination day, when S.R. Nathan went to file his nomination paper, it turned out to be a day for old friends. His comrades from the unions were there. So was his old fruit seller. Singaporeans got a glimpse of the easy style of a man who was to become their president. I am humbled and very moved by this honor to be the sixth president and the second elected president of Singapore. More so being returned unopposed. This places on me an even heavier responsibility to discharge my duties. The man whose unflinching courage had supported the first generation of Singapore leaders was now the trusted president of a younger generation of Singaporeans. As a public officer, you have never hesitated to offer considered judgment and advice to ministers even when you deferred from them. You are eminently qualified to serve as a symbol for the nation and to exercise the powers which the Constitution has vested in you. I promise to give off my best, the very best I can, and without fear or favour. I'll be a president for all Singaporeans. Every community of Singaporeans will be my parish. He gave his blessings to the extension of the term of nominated MPs from two to two and a half years. And the government supported his proposal for shorter terms for the reappointment of members of the Council of Presidential Advisers from six to four years. In 2005, at 81 years of age, 
he heeded the call to run for another six-year term. Fellow Singaporeans, friends, I'm very humbled and grateful for the honour of being returned unopposed for a second presidential term. I stood only because of the call by Singaporeans like you from all walks of life and the support that you have given me this past six years. So we Singapore Tong Pao Wahan Kanshe Tacha the Tusu Wa Chang Chai Tanran Tong Tong Wahui Chin Li Awe Saudara Saudari Yang Hadin Saya ucapkan terima kasih beribuan terima kasih kepada anda semua yang datang ke sini untuk menyokong saya. Saya telah terpilih sebagai presiden buat kali kedua. Saya akan jalankan tugas sebaik-baiknya. Singapura bergantung kepada kita semua. Anda dan saya juga. In doing his best, he had also helped the elected presidency mature in authority and stature. I, Salapan Ramanathan, having been elected president of the Republic of Singapore, do solemnly affirm that I'll faithfully discharge my duties as such to the best of my ability. So from time to time, Parliament has amended the constitutional provisions governing the elected presidency. Indeed, in this spirit, you yourself, Mr. President, have suggested some refinements which the government supports and will table in Parliament in due course. While we continue to improve the detailed workings of the elected presidency, we have not altered its fundamental purpose, which remains as valid as ever. The institution of the elected presidency gave President Nathan the second key to unlock the national reserves. But he didn't have to exercise his powers until 2009. And accumulated reserves for a rainy day. In September 2008, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, a leading American investment bank, triggered an unprecedented economic meltdown. Singapore was not spared. The social repercussions on Singaporeans were dire. The decision to draw from the reserves to save jobs and ease credit flow was hammered out in just 11 days before the budget was presented to Parliament. In the news tonight, extraordinary measures for an unprecedented crisis. For the first time ever, Singapore dips into its reserves to fund a budget to save jobs and boost lending. The government has made the case to the President and the Council of President, Presidential Advisers for this cost of $4.9 billion to be funded from the past reserves on grounds that the circumstances we face are exceptional and the extraordinary measures that the government is undertaking are temporary and will not be built into longer-term government programs. Swift and clear decision-making was required in a time of crisis. I recognize the importance of giving confidence to go ahead with the measures proposed in the budget with particular reference to past reserves, bearing in mind if the situation prolonged or worsened, negative consequences would have kicked in, making any measures too late to be of any effect to stem events. So we've never done this before. It's a big step, but the President has decided we want to make sure that everybody understands uh, we're firing all our guns. Uh, and I think it had its effect because uh, quite to everybody's surprise, including ours, within a quarter the economy stabilised and the quarter after that uh, we were growing again. So much so that uh, many Singaporeans really didn't feel the crisis. And when we did recover, uh, we decided as a matter of prudence and also discipline, um, since we were able to afford it, we uh, committed and paid back into the old past reserves uh, the money which we had spent. He understood very well the uh, 
formal uh, powers that he had as uh, the president holding the uh, second key, uh, the custodial functions of the president. So he approached it in a very practical way, and I would say uh, in a very wise way as well. We have a lot of respect and trust for each other. So when he became president, I think that we were able to take advantage of that. And uh, he, he fitted into the role uh, very naturally. Not just because we knew one another, but also because as president, uh, he reached out to a lot of Singaporeans. He's naturally very gregarious and interested in people. Diplomacy was another area of significant contributions. The president made numerous state visits, and he also hosted many dignitaries. Drawing on his own diplomatic skills and experience, he helped enlarge Singapore's presence in the world. He was also a champion of Singaporeans who contribute to the social sphere. From recognizing professions like teaching and nursing to volunteers, President Nathan was always personally involved in conferring special awards. This was a president with a great empathy for the people, especially ordinary Singaporeans. In 1991, the Singapore Indian Development Association, or SINDA, was set up as a self-help group for the Indian community. President Nathan played an instrumental role in its start and kept a watchful eye over the community. The president also worked on what he saw as the Singaporean parish under his watch. He consolidated fundraising for charities under the President's Challenge, a community project he mooted in 2000. And he was often at the forefront of the fundraising drive, whether by putting ink and brush to paper or by taking to the stage in other ways in television performances. Go placidly amid the noise and haste and remember what peace there may be in silence as far as possible, without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. This was one president who had the full understanding of the needs of the charity sector, having risen above hard times in his own youth and having served in the social service sector himself. I think President Amat Paham in this case is because he has been very involved in his work masyarakat uh, jadi mereka faham beliau faham apakah kesukaran-kesukaran yang dihadapi oleh rumah-rumah tebungan seperti rumah orang tua atau rumah kanak-kanak yatim jadi perhatian faham apa kesukaran yang selalu diambil kira dalam tugas-tugas yang kita lakukan job ya yeah. By the time President Nathan stepped down in 2011, the President's Challenge had raised more than 100 million Singapore dollars for more than 500 beneficiary organizations. In his tenure, the President made many public appearances. To some people, they were part of his job. But to those directly involved, the moments were special. When Tan Guan Heng launched his book, Night Butterfly, in 2001, the president was no ordinary honorary guest. In the 1970s, when Tan needed help for a book business, Nathan, who was then director of the National Council of Social Services, stepped in. And the first thing which struck me was that he, he sounded very sincere. 
You see, when you, when you cannot see, you can judge a person by, by his voice, voice, you know, by his tone of voice. President Nadan's uh, timely intervention changed my life. The alternative would have been to sell biscuits, for which I was utterly incapable. As Chancellor of the National University of Singapore, President Nathan made great efforts to foster a closer relationship with the University of Malaya through his personal ties with the Chancellor of UM, Sultan Aslan Shah. And when Singapore's National University wanted a record-breaking golf event to mark its centenary, the non-golfer helped pull it off. The, ball all the, way back the, the president's game. involvement was something golfer Maradan Mamat can testify to. Hearing of Mardan's win in the 2006 Singapore Masters, he invited the golfer and his family to tea at the Istana. I think he's a very kind man. He's, he's a very, very nice man. Last thing that he advised me to uh, use the money wisely so, so that he do, uh, doesn't waste uh, uh, whatever you achieve. You know? So I think he's giving uh, me and my family a very good advice. But this wasn't a president who was there only for the people's triumphs. In the recent tragedy on Nikko Highway, a courageous foreman lost his life in order to ensure the safety of those who worked under him. Without any publicity, you, Mr. President, went to visit the grieving widow and the two young children. You have made efforts to ensure that she and the children will not have to undergo the hardship and suffering which was inflicted on your mother, your six siblings and you when your father died prematurely. Mr. President, you're a tough man but with a kind and loving heart. Three. A staunch believer in education, the President launched the SR Northern Education Upliftment Fund, funded through royalties from the sale of his memoirs and donations. At the launch in September 2011, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong spoke of Northern's legacy. His journey from a runaway sleeping in alleys to the President of the Republic is an inspiring one. Although not everyone can be President, all of us can achieve our potential here because ours is a meritocratic society and we are determined to make it a land of opportunity for all our citizens. The beneficiaries included students from the Institute of Technical Education, Polytechnics and the four ethnic self-help groups. He's been a very strong supporter both you know, in terms of encouraging us uh, to promote and do more in the areas of education uh, but also in terms of being a, a very generous benefactor to us. Mr. Nathan shared with us how uh, when, when he was young and his family wasn't very well off, uh, there were a couple of incidences um, relating to the Eurasian community which, which touched his heart and helped to really build his strong bonds with the community. And I guess over the years, having grown up in, in, the, uh, in the area um, where many Eurasians live, he also you know, continued that close relationship with the community. S.R. Northern understood deeply the delicate issues of race and dialects. He married Urmila Nande at 34. After 16 years of courtship, she was almost 30. For years, the relationship was opposed by her parents. They were Bengalis, while Northern was Tamil. Northern persevered and eventually won their blessings. The father of two gave his unconditional support when his daughter, Jutika, married Xiongge Eng, a Chinese lawyer. The man who counted Chinese and Malays among his close and lifelong friends even took up Chinese lessons. Well, I speak English. I speak Tamil, I speak Malay, and I don't speak Mandarin. 
So I thought I should try and at least learn Mandarin. The president's interest in Chinese calligraphy was similar to his interest in languages, and his calligraphy teacher recognized the heart the president has for the art. He often likes to have a new book, that new book. 他自己承认，他也是出身一个比较贫困的一个环境，啊，就是因为遇到这么多有心人，给他机会，帮助他，提供机会给他，嗯，造成他今天能够坐上国家的第一把交椅。Being a experienced person, having in his own life struggled and worked through the civil service, he understood, and he was able to make a distinction. Between the role of the president and that of the government, it was very clear that his role was custodial. But that did not mean that、uh, he would not offer his observations on areas outside his custodial powers. And after the presidential inspection, the parade ceremony. Ceremonial, custodial. The president's role was this and more. He was also a unifying force. What you may ask is the secret of this indispensable man for all seasons. His secret for success is that he took life in his stride, stuck to his principles, and carried out his duties to the utmost of his ability, driven by a deep sense of loyalty and responsibility. I think he established the presidency as a post where not only. Does he have his custodial duties,、uh, making sure the appointments are sound, making sure that the budget is、uh, within what we can afford, and we're not spending our money profligately, but also showing、uh, being the face for Singapore,、um, representing Singapore,、uh, held in high regard by all Singaporeans,、uh, with a great deal of warmth and、uh, personal. Uh, touch to his, uh, uh, not just to his public persona, but what people could really feel. This was Mr. S. R. Nathan, and Mrs. Nathan too. From day one, S. R. Nathan saw himself as a civil servant, answering the call to duty. And it was a quote by American President Abraham Lincoln, shared with Nathan by a British soldier during the war years, which became his guiding principle in life. I do the very best I know how, the very best I can, and I mean to keep doing so until the end. If the end brings me out all right, what is said against me won't amount to anything. If the end brings me out wrong. Ten angels swearing I was right would make no.